Welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Pentecost. We enjoy our time after that celebration that we've had of coming back together for our first in-person gathering. We are so thankful that we had 72 come and join us. We also know that there are many who are choosing to stay at home. Today you're witnessing um, the shortened version of the service that will come out after noon sometime or late evening at the very latest for Sunday evening as we will see the full worship service presented from this morning. You are able right now to watch the children's sermon and the sermon itself, but we invite you to come back for the service. We wanted to provide you something for Sunday mornings, so here it is, and we hope that you're able to join us for virtual worship. Know that it will be at the very latest every week late on Sunday morning when it's posted, on Sunday evening when it's posted. Wanted to also invite you to come, if you're watching this before our second service ends, that you can come and join us for our picnic and enjoy a time of fellowship that's all outside, bring your own food. And we wanted to let you know about the Congregational Care Committee meeting at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Also wanted to let you know about our 5.30 p.m. social activities meeting that is also happening tomorrow. And finally, Brothers of Grace, Bog, is gathering at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. You can see that we're kind of coming back. If you don't feel comfortable meeting in person with any of those meetings, you can call in and we will have the conference line to share our meeting with you. I hope that we can continue to do ministry in the name of Jesus and to know that we can give glory to God. May you enjoy this time of gospel reading, children's message, and our sermon for now. Hope to also see you join us later for the full worship from the Sunday morning service. Have a great day. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went home, and the crowds came together again so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to constrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. He called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. And his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first trying to tie up the strong man then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven of their sins and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. When his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they went to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, boys and girls. I brought with me a birth certificate. It's 
of Laura Marie Catterhenry, now known as Laura Marie Sheck, my wife. She, of course, was born as a female, and her birth date is June 19, 1967, in Columbus, Ohio, Franklin County. And do you know that she's a sister of Jesus? Oh no, not by blood, not by uh, one who comes around and is literally like the brother or sister of Jesus who we read about in our gospel reading just now, but what Jesus says, here are my brother and my sisters, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And Laura is a sister of Jesus, not by blood again, but because of who she is. I also have a picture of Mr. Carr. Steve Carr is a brother of Jesus. And I also have a picture of Barry Wood. He too is a brother of Jesus. And I also have a picture of Gavin and Grayson Patton. They also are brothers of Jesus. In fact, all of us are sisters and brothers of Christ. We gather together knowing that we are able to be loved and cared for. May we know that God loves and cares for us each and every day. Let us pray. Dear God, help us always to know your love that we are able to have that love every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming, we'll see you next week. Grace from our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, our Holy Trinity. Welcome back to the Gospel according to Mark. We've been in John, it's been since before Easter, that we have read anything from Mark. It's all been about John for the most part during this Easter season. But we come back into Mark and it, we're already in chapter three. This rapid narrative sends us today to a place where it doesn't look like Jesus did very well trying to make friends. He seems to have done a poor job of doing so, if that was his objective. Mark, in particular, highlights the lines that distinguish between insiders and outsiders. Those lines are usually difficult to perceive. They rarely fall where you expect them to fall, leaving us to wonder why are these people in and why these folk are out. The people who should be able to figure Jesus out, his own kin, and the religious leaders who watched him grow up in the synagogue can't figure him out either. Or, especially in the case of the religious leaders, they don't want to figure him out. It seems far worse that what they are exhibiting is little curiosity and even less willingness to dwell for a while in ambiguity, a elusive thought. They refuse to go there. They just want all the answers right away, abandoning imagination and opening for calculated answers and opting for that alone. Both groups take divisive steps to curb Jesus' popular influence and perhaps even to remove him from the public life. The preacher's family, well, they think that Jesus has lost his bearings ever since he trucked out to hear John the Baptist teach about repentance. And then he spent 40 days in the wilderness on a retreat. Now he's gone too far and he's made powerful enemies. They think, the family, that Jesus has got to rein in that starry-eyed idealism, pointed rhetoric, and the deviant behavior that he is expressing 
everywhere he goes. What's he doing? Going and proclaiming that you can be free from sin and the power of evil. He should know what happens to prophetic leaders with large followings in this corner of the Roman world. And his family is distraught over the fact that he might fall into that trap. The religious referees attack from a different angle. They warn the community that Jesus is deceptive. What looks true about Jesus is powered by falsehood, you see? Unable to see deliverance for what it is, perhaps because they remain captive to certain criteria and autocratic hierarchies. So they demonize Jesus and call him a follower of Satan. Jesus replies to the twin attacks and speaks about a house divided, the need to dominate the strong man who runs the world and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Each of those sayings deserves expanded explanation on its own, my friends. He refutes those who speak to exploit polarization on their own behalf. The people who underestimate the power of evil in the world and the cynical analysts who imply that the church's nudges are the fault of its congregational leaders. But it's Jesus' final response that speaks most clearly to me about ministry in general and what we need to hear right now from our gracious God. Right now, at a time when we are coming back as congregations clear across the Christian church in America are focused on returning. Right now, we are envisioning the next chapter of our stories. This is our story as we gather back, as we wonder. This is our story of Grace Lutheran Church that we need to hear Jesus. We need Jesus' guidance. We need Jesus' leading. We need Jesus to help us move back into ministry. The last two sentences of today's gospel are powerful. We read, looking at those who sat around him, Jesus said, here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. It's one of those lines that makes you think. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Do you mean spiritual life can actually involve in doing something? I think Jesus is clear in his statement today. No doubt about it. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. There's confusion. Sometimes Jesus says things that are confusing and almost opposite of what you would think he would tend to say. Like, really? You go back? But I must admit, I don't know exactly what anyone in this crowd has done to earn the praise of Jesus, of being ones who are inside, instead of outside like his own kin's people or the religious leaders. And so our understanding of what it means to do the will of God is sketchy at its best. But doing the will of God appears to involve sitting. Now, isn't that strange? The crowd that Jesus surveys is remarkable for being passive, being patient, for being present. They're simply in the house with him. The gospel, according to Mark, becomes a grenade in the hands of too many of us who use its surprises and unpredictability to make people uncomfortable. Certainly there are times when Mark is supposed to unsettle us. In fact, this passage should do that for anyone who wants to control and define Jesus like his family and the religious scholars do in our Gospel reading. But Mark's rhetoric 
that we read today has a way of highlighting welcome and belonging. That's a message that all of us need to hear, especially in the light of the terrible season we have recently endured. We need to realize that God welcomes us. We need to realize that Jesus walks with us. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit has never left us. How great is that? We have to leave the building for some of us over a year, but God never left our side. What a gift. We need to remember that Jesus never walked away from his disciples, the ones who are so faithful and dull of spirit, you see, the ones who don't spark up, but they just sit there. Jesus does not quit when miracles do not come easy. Jesus promises revelation. He guarantees that he will meet those who have fled from him after his resurrection and join them and see them and be with them. All Jesus asks is that people follow, that we all just simply follow, sit and wait and be with him. There is no heroism in Mark except for Jesus himself. The way into kinship with Jesus, connecting with Jesus, belonging with Jesus, linking with Jesus is simply to stick around. It's to acknowledge that you've been caught up into a new reality, this transformational alternative reality called the kingdom of God, and that you are part of it and hold on for the ride to go and join those brothers and sisters that we've discussed in the children's time, that we are one in Jesus Christ. That's probably not the entirety of what it means to do or to accomplish or to commit to the will of God, but it seems to be the biggest part, as far as Mark is concerned, that we just are simply there for one another. What happens after that? Once a person commits to sticking around and letting Jesus be Jesus, is where the surprises really start. Thank God we have the gift of imagination to take us to the place where God wants us to be. Thank God we have some goals to consider here at Grace Lutheran Church as we share in ministry and move toward 2026, trying to fulfill some of those goals. I wonder though, what God has in store that might be a surprise. Dream with me and let the Spirit lead us and guide us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.